What's happening, everybody? I'm Steve, and welcome back to Junk Drummer TV, where I give my initial reactions, my hot takes, and my analysis on the drummers of today and yesterday, maybe tomorrow if I stick around that long. I am a professional drum teacher and a gigging musician, and I have been for the last 20 years. That seemed pretty natural, right? You couldn't tell I was reading it. Now, with that out of the way, I have been waiting for this episode for so long. Uh, I've been planning to do it since I started the channel, but I am a fan of delayed gratification, but I cannot wait any longer we're going to be watching Jean Paul Gaster of the legendary Maryland Earth Rockers Clutch. If I had a top 10, and I do because I am going to do a top 10 video eventually, I just need to put the energy into it. The list is made, I just got to do it. Jean Paul is in my top 10. I've been watching him since 1993 when I saw the video for Shogun named Marcus on Headbangers Ball, RIP Headbangers Ball. This is definitely going to be an analysis video because I know pretty much every song he's ever recorded. I have seen Clutch more than any band that's lived. Second's probably the Almond Brothers. Third's probably Modesky Martin and Wood. But Clutch is number one. Clutch has the perfect career as a band. They've been around for 27 years. 28 maybe? 28 maybe? And they've just stayed at the same level of artistic greatness and popularity. They never got as big as Metallica, but they also never had to worry about keeping up those Metallica type numbers. They've just etched out, in my opinion, the best career that a musician could hope for because they have kept complete artistic control over their music and it shows they have all the integrity. Oh man, I can't wait for this episode. I love Clutch and I love Jean-Paul so much. So, this preamble could go on way too long. But I'm going to tell you this. Please stick around for the middle of the video. I'm going to give the all-time greatest blistering hot take about Jean-Paul. And then, after the end of the video, stick around. Because I'm going to give you a story time about this picture. Which was one of the best moments of my life. So, let's get into... Jean-Paul Gaster. It's Gaster or Gaster, I'm not sure. Because I've heard different interviewers say it both ways. Of Clutch, and they're going to be playing Burning Beard. Oh, Nashville. Remember when there was gigs? has one of the best left hands in all of rock and roll. We'll talk about why that is. Okay, so you can tell that there's some math going on. We're going to talk about the math in depth in this team. There was a metric modulation that just happened. We'll talk about all of this when he gets back into that verse again. This is from, man, it's hard for me to say what is my favorite clutch record, but this the this is off Robot Hive, right? I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to not say that's my favorite. Okay, so what's going on right here? Uh, again, analysis video, I know this. Uh, that is in 9.8. But it's it's a it's a weird metric modulation from the seven four that you just heard from uh, the chorus of this song. He's playing like a swing in nine eight, and he is one of my favorite odd time players. Clutch plays a lot of odd time, a lot of odd time, and he makes it groove so hard. Uh, where like Danny Carey plays plays odd times to kind of try to like abduct your soul and deliver it into an alternate reality and universe, <laughs> Jean Paul takes odd times and just makes them groovy as fuck. They're, he's such a grooving player in odd time, and it's really hard to get disconnected from the math that's going on. So let's check this out. He hits this crash at the one. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. He's playing it swinging. It, 
it's, that part always kind of felt like Mitch Mitchell to me. Now this right here, we're in seven, four now. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. And uh, we've talked about this before disguising your odd times and when he's when he goes to the seven four because it's about his subdivisions during the nine eight it's like a swing and triplet subdivision and right here the subdivision's more quarter note eighth note and if you'll notice he doesn't play a two you know if you think about the, that as being a measure of like four four and three he doesn't play a two until the the six one, two, three, four, one, two, three, right? Uh, and he 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 masks that two, four, or that, that seven, four. He could have went one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, or something that's very obvious. But listen to this. He plays all these E's and U's and ands and everything but a two and four, and it keeps your ear kind of floating over the time. Yeah, right there is where he does the two three. A lot of e's and us in that. His left hand. Oh, see, cause I know for a fact that he's a jazz guy. They always take their. If the song is in on time, Clutch always takes the solo in on time. So after that flurry of greatness there, here is that blistering hot take. And if you've ever been in a bar with me past two o'clock and Clutch comes on the jukebox, you have been uh, subjected to this rant. This is the blisteringest hot take. If Led Zeppelin were to ever return, and we know that's never going to happen, because I think Celebration Day pretty much put a put a put a cherry on top of what we were going to get out of Led Zeppelin. If they were to ever to return, Jean-Paul Gaster should be the drummer. That's right. I said it. Jason Bonham did a great job on Celebration Day. I've got that box set. And first couple songs, you could tell he was, uh, you know, easing into it. By the third, fourth song, Jason is on fire. But look, Jason Bonham, who's a great drummer, he he's not a John Bonham drummer. He's got that stuff. He's got that stuff. He's got that stuff in him, right, of course. But John Paul is the closest thing we've ever had to a John Bonham player, and here's why. I think John Paul or John Bonham was one one of the most misunderstood drummers in the history of rock and roll, because you know everybody knows you know. You know we know that lick, right? We know that he's a big basher. We know he's got big sounds. But there's the subtlety. He was almost a funk drummer. When you hear songs like Out on the Tile and The Crunge, that's funk shit, right? His favorite drummers were jazz drummers. You know, that, the bottom lick, you know, that came from Elvin Jones and jazz players. He loved James Brown drummers. Jean Paul comes from that same area. I know this for a fact. Stick around for story time. John Paul would be the most perfect fit if Led Zeppelin were to ever get back together. You heard it here first, people, and I'm 99% that I'm right about this. He has he has the R&B funk stuff that people don't think about when you think about John Bonham. Uh, let's that's it. There's this, man. John Paul and Led Zeppelin. You heard it. Four, five, six, one. So now we're in six, four. And if you notice, you know, uh, this song feels like when you're listening to it, it feels like you're skating. You know, it's like you're on ice in dress shoes. The time, the time is everywhere. And it's kind of got this kind of disconcerting feel. It's great because it's one of their best songs. But, by, but, and you know, it's odd stuff, right? We got that 9 8 that goes into that 7 4. And even when they now they get us back to an even time, they still play it in 6 4. But it hits real hard because, especially with with American ears, you know, our clave is one, two, three, 
1984, right? That's American Clave. And it feels really comfortable and it feels like, oh, whew. it's like a, it's like a safety net, like a, like a warm blanket when, when they finally drop into an even time. <laughs> Neil is like a drill sergeant and a preacher. Now, this halftime, halftime four right here, this comes in and crushes you because you've had that nine, you've had that seven, you've had that six four, which is uh, not as disconcerting, but still not that comfortable four four. And when they when they lay this down right here, and I've seen them do this live, it's it's bone crushing when that four four drops. Their odd times never feel like they're just trying to be cute and cheeky. It's just how the, the riff was written. It feels very organic, which is another thing about Led Zeppelin's odd times. They just feel organic. Sometimes musicians who are literate kind of go overboard with the odd times. They're just doing it to be like, hey, hey look, I can do an odd time. That just happens to be... John Paul is killing it. So let's talk about his left hand. Uh, I know for fact, story time, that he is a big studier of jazz. He's definitely played the Ted Reed books and like progressive steps to syncopation. And he's worked on the, the, the independence of, you know, doing like, you know, your jazz pattern. And playing all of your different, uh, you know, left hand comping stuff against that jazz pattern. Uh, if you want to work on your ghost notes in straight time and rock and roll, you want to work on your rock and roll ghost notes, get that coordination, get that jazz four way independence coordination, and it's going to free up your left hand to be able to play a lot more interesting ghost notes. His ghost note playing, besides Levon Helm, is my favorite. It just makes everything dance. It's the reason why his odd time playing feels so well because he plays so such good choices in his left hand ghost note playing. Oh man. In the metal band that I play in, I rip him off a lot. Like this groove right here, I play this groove a lot. Jazz shit right there. Look at how light. He's real light. He's a big dude. He's real light. But oh, Jean Paul, my dude. Ah, I've been waiting for that start so long. If you don't know Clutch, and it's really, it could be kind of easy to not know Clutch, because again, you know, Clutch is the band that opens up for Slayer. They're not the band that's going to fill up your Civic Center, but they well, they've played in your Civic Center because they open up for all the big bands. There's so many big bands in this in the world that love Clutch, and they just want to put them on tour with them because they know they can learn from them. These guys are craftsmen. If you watched. Uh, if you have this DVD, Clutch Live at the 930 Club, get it. DVD, anyway. In that DVD, you just see that those cats just practice all the time when they're on tour. You know, there's not whoring around and partying going on. Those cats are crafting their skills and sharpening their shit at all times. Now, here's the story time. This is one of the greatest moments of my life. Uh, you've talked, you've heard me talk on the channel before that I used to be a bartender at the, at the rock venue in my hometown. It's long defunct. And I got to bartend the clutch show and I was very, very excited and I'd been just fired up all week. Cause when, you know, when we had big bands, like we had hell yeah, and we had Guar and we had, uh, hate breed and when cl we know and clutch right and I'm I was the basically the bar manager I had free fucking reign so I could go anywhere I go the backstage if I wanted to I was the employee there and one of the bigger employees one of the more important employees anyway and I was talking to the uh, the the door guy and this good door guy named Huck Huck if you're still out there man I fucking miss you uh, me and Huck Huck was just this big gigantic guy that looked like he should probably be in prong. And, you know, I told him all week, I was just like, 
I just want to meet Jean Paul. I just want to see him. I know I'm, I've, I've seen him a bunch, but I want to be able to just just say thank you. I just want to give it just a moment to, with this guy. Well, I'm in an area where Clutch rules the planet. And when Clutch comes into town, they sell out wherever. And like sell out at this club was like 800 to 1,000 people. And there was that many people there that night. And it was just so packed. And we were four, five, six deep at the bar. And I was not get, getting my chance to go try to meet the fellas. Because a lot of times I just go out back and get on tour buses. Uh, I was definitely on Hate Breed's tour bus. Um, and uh, no, I went on there. I was on Blind Melon's tour bus. Hate Breed were kind of assholes to us, actually. Um, so the show gets played. This is the era when they had the keyboard player. And it was around Electric Worry. Electric Worry. I can't remember. Was that Bill Street to Oblivion, I think? And the show happened, and I got to get away from the bar a little bit and watch the show, but I just didn't have time to go do the thing. And it was, you know, those if you've ever bartended with that many people in the crowd, it's a it's a real hard job. And uh, the show came and went, and we were closing down, and we were, uh, you know, cleaning up. And I was down. I was like, man, I get to fucking talk to Jean Paul. I didn't get a, get a chance. And so I'm cleaning, and the bar's been emptied, and Huck comes up to me and goes, Hey, man, you have somebody behind you that wants a beer. And by this time, I'm kind of pissed off. I've made a shit ton of money, but I want to get the fuck out of there. I didn't get to meet Clutch. Uh, I didn't get to see much of the show anyway. I want to get my bread and go the fuck home. So I'm like, look, motherfuckers, this place is closed. And I turned around, and it's fucking Jean-Paul. Huck had went to Jean-Paul and told him that there's a drummer up front. And if you see this picture here, you see that I'm wearing uh, uh, the drum store's hat that I was working at at the time. Where I was teaching. This was, uh, God, well, like I said, whatever the year Electric Worry was out. And I was like, oh, shit, there's Jean-Paul. And Huck had went to Jean-Paul and told him, like, hey, man, this bartender's a drummer. And he wants to meet you, right? And my section of the bar was closed. The other bar in the other room still had some stragglers. So, man, I go over and I just fucking try to be as calm as possible. And I tell him what he means to me. I tell him that I've been a fan of his since the, since I saw, saw Shogun named Marcus. And he was so kind to me. He was so fucking cool. And he told me, uh, you know, I told him that uh, I teach Shogun Named Marcus for students to learn uh, hand-foot coordination stuff inside of a groove. And I teach elephant riders as a way to introduce 7, 8, and 5, 4. Uh, you know, and, and I told him, and I think that he kind of saw that I was legit, that I knew all those, uh, I knew that those time, what those time signatures were. And we just, we talked, man. He fucking talked to me for like 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And he told me the, this great story about when he was in college, he had got a student loan and he took his student loan money because we all did stupid shit with our student loan money. It was just isn't really stupid shit, but he took his student loan money and he went on tour with Elvin Jones and went to like, I can't remember, three, four, five straight shows of Elvin Jones. And he told this story of like, he had been to so many Elvin Jones shows that Elvin Jones had recognized him. And like maybe the last show that he saw of Elvin Jones Elvin Jones's uh, bass drum pedal comes unhooked, and he had kind of seen that they, this guy was probably a drummer. He comes to see five shows, right? And Elvin Jones looks over to the side, and I'm sure these were like uh, jazz uh, clubs, like jazz venues. And he's like, looks at Jean Paul, looks down at his pedal, and and like telling Jean Paul, "Hey man, my my pedal's fucked up. Can you fix it?" And Jean Paul got to get on stage, crawl in behind Elvin Jones. And set and and hit and 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 fix his bass drum pedal. And then Jean Paul said this. He was like, "Dude, I could I couldn't help it." He's like, "I, I you know I put the uh, I reattached the bass drum pedal and then I went boom and you know played a note with Elvin behind it and ran off and Elvin was like, "Yeah, man, thanks." Now that by itself would be a, a great moment for me because I got to meet one of my heroes. He's a hero of mine. I fucking love him. But then this happened. I could not have paid my best friend to do this better so as i said you know i was uh i was in the front bar we had a back bar back bar always had stragglers and the front bar we get motherfuckers out of there and i'm talking to jean paul and i'm in a jam band at this time uh in town and we had a, you know, a little bit of a following and as 
people are you know leaving the the place they're they're passing us and you know Jean Paul's being very nice to everyone but a lot of people were very kind about not fucking with him because they could see that he was in a conversation because people love clutch you don't want to piss a clutch off but I'm talking to him and this just dazed out hippie dude who had seen my band was came up to me didn't even notice that Jean Paul was sitting there. And was like, hey, man, are you, you know, Steve from this jam band? And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And he and he looks to his buddy and he goes, this is the drummer for the band name. This guy's the best drummer in town. This is a bad motherfucker right here. You got to be listening to him. And then I turned like beat her head and I looked over and John Paul heard all this shit go down. And he goes, well. Looks like you got this fucking town on lockdown, huh? And it was wonderful. I couldn't have paid my best friend to do that better. It just came out of nowhere. Just some drugged out hippie wanted to tell me that he thought I was a good drummer. And he did it in front of Jean Paul. And I love telling that story. And I've been waiting to get that story on Junk Drummer TV since May 14th of last year when I started this. So, there you go. Jean Paul Clutch. If you don't know him, you should know him. Learn those songs. They're really great songs to get your odd time playing up. And man, they're just fucking great songs, man. Elephant Riders is a great record. Uh, 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 Memphis to Oblivion, uh, whatever that record, that's a great record. Uh, Robot Hive Exit, they're all good. They're all good. There's no bad ones. And now the root of the problem has been isolated. Keep practicing until it's easy.